The normal Storg robbery was a bank robbery and hostage crisis that happened in Sweden in 1973. Two armed robbers held four bank employees captive for six days. Eventually forced out of the bank by tear gas, the two robbers were arrested. But it was the reaction of the captives that gained the greatest attention. The four bank employees became reluctant to come forward with evidence and statements to the police who had just rescued them. In a backward sort of way, the four employees became defenders of the two armed robbers, who days before had threatened their lives. So great was the response of the employees in support of their captors, a phrase was coined called the Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome is a psychological response. It occurs when hostages or abuse victims bond with their captors or abusers. This psychological connection develops over the course of the days, weeks, months, or even years of captivity or abuse. In our text today, I see the Stockholm Syndrome at play. Now, let me explain. At, at the very least, I sense our love affair with the familiar, the predictable, those patterns of behavior that give us a feeling of being in control. The Apostle Paul has received a report that the believers in Colossae were flirting with going back under the fallen spiritual forces, the faulty spiritual teachings, and the false spiritual practices from which Jesus had rescued them. Going back to the familiar, the predictable, the feeling of being in control. You say, well, that happened a long time ago. Well, that happens to me every day. Because I, I love the familiar. I like the predictable. I like feeling like I'm in control. And I tell you what, all of those qualities sound very attractive to me, especially in this extended season of stress and uncertainty. As we listen to the scripture today, these are words of warning spoken by the Apostle Paul to the church at Colossae about going back and becoming captives once again. So let's listen together. Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in it. Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food or drink or in the matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is Christ. Let no one condemn you by delighting in ascetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm. Such people are inflated by empty notions of their unspiritual mind. He doesn't hold on to the head, from whom the whole body, nursed and held together by its ligaments and tendons, grows with growth from God. If you died with Christ to the elements of this world, why do you live as if you still belonged to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All these regulations refer to what is destined to perish by being used up. They are human commands and doctrines. Although these have a reputation of, for wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and severe treatment of the body, they are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. Let's pray together. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts May they be acceptable in your sight, Lord Jesus, the one who is greater than. Together, God's people said, Amen. There's an expression that's used, better the devil you know than the devil you don't know. In other words, better to stick with a harmful behavior, person, or circumstance because you have learned to cope. You know the rules. You can work the system. I see that taking place in our text. The church at Colossae, these first followers of Jesus, they had heard the gospel. They had responded to it. They had come out of Judaism, out of the teachings of the Jewish faith. They had come from the mystery religions. We would call them pagan religions. They had come from all different walks of life and now being gathered together as the body of Christ. There's a teacher, a false teacher, who is proclaiming to them truths, half-baked truths that are not 
the truth of the scripture. And so Paul is warning the church of Colossae, saying, don't get pulled back in. Don't go back under that old way. You've been rescued, he says. Don't become captives once again. You see, it's one thing to uh, continue living with the devil, you know. It's another response to have been free from the devil and willingly align yourself in that harmful system again. Back in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, the Apostle Paul has given this, this warning to his readers. He says, be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world rather than Christ. Paul says, don't let anyone take you captive. But I think we have a bit of a Stockholm Syndrome. We like our captors. We like the predictable. We love the familiar. And any thought of changing is just dismissed offhand because I don't want to change. I want to stay where I am. Because change, well, that means I'll have to grow. Something different will have to happen. And so we stick with the familiar. But as a follower of Jesus, you have, I have, a new allegiance, a new way of living. Having been rescued by Jesus, Paul says, don't become captives again. Be reminded of your rescue, what Jesus has done for you. Listen, Paul writes, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in it. Uh, our translation says in him, but it makes more sense with the grammar and also the way the word can be translated. That Paul is speaking about the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in it. He triumphed, the greater than triumph of Jesus over these fallen spiritual forces, rulers and authorities, Paul writes. He speaks of hostile demonic beings aligned with Satan. And these demonic forces find earthly representatives in systems of government, even in religious systems. For instance, the Roman Empire and Jewish, Jewish leaders conspired together to crucify Jesus. These powers, rulers, and authorities, angry at Jesus' challenge of their, to their sovereignty, they stripped him naked, angry at, held him up to public contempt, and celebrated a triumph over him. But the power and the paradox of the cross is that those fallen spiritual forces that had animated earthly powers, Jesus stripped them, disgraced them, triumphed over them by the cross. The image that Paul is using is that of a victory parade. The conquering commander leading his captives through the streets in triumph. The greater than general who has won the battle. And as he parades through the streets, he takes the captives with him. Paul is saying that the power of the cross, the triumph of the cross, is this. The crucified one is the conquering king. He is leading this parade. He is out ahead of us. He's the head. He's disarmed the rulers and authorities. And he is walking as a triumphant king. But Paul says, don't go back and walk with the captives. Stick with the king. Stay with the king. Don't find yourselves under the fallen spiritual forces. Nor should we find ourselves under faulty spiritual teachings. Hear the scripture once again. Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food or drink or in the matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is Christ. Let no one condemn you by delighting in ascetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm. Such people are inflated by empty notions of their unspiritual mind. He doesn't hold on to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons, grows with a growth from God. You see, faulty spiritual teachers 
have a unique capacity to tap into our sense of shame and judgment. Paul says, don't let anyone judge you. Let no one condemn you. Because faulty spiritual teachers, they're drawn to it. They see a person whom they can shame into obedience to their false teaching, and they have them hook, line, and sinker. Paul says, don't let anyone judge you about food, drink, festival, new moon, Sabbath day. And all of those commands were rooted in the Jewish faith, rooted in the Old Testament. And those laws were not bad. God gave his people those laws, but Paul says those laws were just a shadow. The real presence is Jesus. And the inclusion of non-Jews into the body of Christ was one of those places where the, the early followers of Jesus really wrestled. They, they were always back and forth. Does someone, to become a Christian, do they have to become Jewish first? And Paul is saying, no, not at all. Because those old familiar ways, they were ethnic and cultural markers. Paul says they can't be forced on another person. There's no judgment. There's no shame. Paul also warns the followers of Jesus. Let no one condemn you by delighting in ascetic practices, worships of angels, visionary realms, elements of the mystery religions that some of the believers there in Colossae had come out of, and also within the Jewish context, the Jewish faith context, there were those who saw themselves as the spiritual elite. They were super spiritual. They saw things that ordinary Christians didn't see. But Paul is reminding us, and he warns us, he says there is but one spiritually elite person in the church. His name is Jesus. He is the head of the church. He is the leader of the church. All things are held together by him. And all, not just the spiritually elite, but all followers of Jesus are to be growing up in him. So we saw the fallen spiritual forces, the faulty spiritual teachings. And Paul speaks of false spiritual practices. Hear the scripture once more. If you died with Christ to elements of this world, why do you live as if you still belonged to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All these regulations refer to what is destined to perish by being used up. There are human commands and doctrines. Although these have a reputation for wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and severe treatment of the body, they are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. Paul writes and says, if you've died with Christ, remember from our teaching last week, we saw the union between Christ and those who call him Lord and Savior and the joining together of life. Jesus' life given to us, Jesus' accomplishments given to us because we are in Christ, we are united together with him. So if we have died with Christ, our union with Jesus and his finished work is the basis of our life in Christ. These commands, don't handle, don't taste, don't touch, are all about legalism. Now, in our walk with Jesus, yes, there are boundaries. We can't just do as we please. But the boundary we have not now is not a human regulation. Not something that's uh, been given to us to, to uh, hem us in. What we have now as a boundary is the life of Jesus. The life of Jesus is our guide. He is our way of showing us how to live out this Christian life. And to do that, we must be in relationship with him. The old system of laws and regulations is now about Jesus as Lord and our relationship with him. And I, I would say to you that if you have not begun a relationship with Jesus, let today be the day. I invite you because Jesus, I, I believe if you're listening to this, 
I believe that Jesus is drawing you to himself. And I would encourage you, I'd invite you, let today be the day that you acknowledge your need of Jesus and say yes to his gift of life and the gift of grace that he gives to us. Paul had written earlier, he says, as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, you can do that this day, right now, and I encourage you to do that. Oh, I tell you what, if you give yourself to Jesus, if you say yes to Jesus today, would, would you send me a quick email so that I could respond to you and encourage you and help you? Ken at orchardnh.org. Again, send an email. Let me know that you've made that choice so that we can come alongside of you and help you to continue to grow. Ken at orchardnh.org. For all of us, who call ourselves followers of Jesus, even if you have just begun right this very moment, or you've been walking with Jesus for a long, long time. Here's how we live in relationship with Jesus. It's some simple steps we can do each day. We join Jesus in the expression of his life and his lordship. We have received him as Lord. He has given us his life. So I would invite you to do this. Begin your day, first of all, by giving thanks. Give thanks to Jesus. As you awaken to the day, give thanks to Jesus. Look for how Jesus is at work in your workplace. Look for how Jesus is at, at play in your neighborhood. Look for how Jesus is working through um, the friends that you have. Where do you see Jesus at work? And join him in that. Listen to others without judgment. At the top of the list, when those who are not yet believers in Jesus are asked, what do you dislike most about people who identify themselves as followers of Jesus? At the top of the list is that they are judgmental people. To join Jesus in his life and his lordship, I invite you to listen to people without judgment. Without judgment. Simply listen. And then as the opportunity comes, tell others about the life of Jesus, not the laws of Jesus. Tell others about the life of Jesus, not human commands and doctrines. Tell others about Jesus. And I would invite you to be mindful, to be wise of the fact that there are uh, false Christian teachers out there. They come under the name and they, they use uh, Christian words, spiritual words, but at the end of the day, you'd have to look at it and say, were they talking about Jesus or were they talking about something they made up? Stick with Jesus. Walk with Jesus. Those, those faulty Christian practices, spiritual practices as well, stay away from those. Stick with Jesus. And in all of this, let the warning of the Apostle Paul given to those first followers of Jesus a long time ago be a reminder to us Let's be wise as we walk with Jesus. Let's stick with Jesus because he is greater than. Oh, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help me to walk in relationship with you. I know, Lord Jesus, that I can be distracted, I can be influenced, I can be drawn away, but let me walk with you in, in every waking moment, even in my dreams, Lord Jesus, let me walk with you. Join you in what you are doing in our world around us. And Lord, as I see you at work, as I listen to others without judgment, as I look for the way that you are moving people towards yourself, drawing people to yourself, I will give you all the glory because you are so much greater than me. And thank you, Jesus. Pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen.